everybody. We can go ahead and jump into our Bible study. We thank God for each of you that are here on this evening as we have gathered ourselves together for the purpose of studying God's holy and divine word. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for another day's journey. Health and strength. Thank you for your kindness and for your mercy. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Right now, oh God, as always, we ask that you would uh, give us a fresh anointing of thy Holy Spirit, that we can take this, thy word, rightly divided and imparted to us an understanding that will help us to be all that you are calling us to be. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And let's all say together, amen. Put your hands together and give God just a hand clap of praise for God's goodness. We welcome you on tonight, everybody that is here, everybody that may, may be watching us across various platforms, we invite you. Uh, if you are watching us across various platforms to tag your friends and your neighbors and let them know uh, that we're on the air and that we're having Bible study tonight and uh, we invite them to tune in uh, and see what thus says the Lord. We're going to continue tonight. I will walk through uh, the first book of Acts uh, to see uh, what the Lord is saying to us as it relates to our responsibilities to be kingdom builders. And remember we talked about the fact that Acts is a book that's actually the second volume, believed to be the second volume of Luke. The person who wrote Luke, which was named Luke, also wrote um, Acts. Uh, so we are getting a first-hand account um, from the writer of Acts, from, from Luke. We're getting a first-hand account of how the church as we know it, the Christian church, comes to life, how it comes to be what it is we represent uh, today. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna jump right into we're gonna jump right into this um, to this teaching um, this teaching lesson today and see what the Lord uh, is saying for us. Tonight we're gonna talk about uh, this week and next week we're gonna talk about the replacement player, the replacement player and we're going to uh, we're going to see how that theme that motif fits into um, this particular portion of Acts chapter 1. We want to use for a main thought this thought, this idea. Uh, next, we want to use for a main thought. Uh, we are all players in the game called life. Sometimes the script that we must follow or the rules by which we must play don't seem fair or possible but we still play. We play because we have no other choice and while we play, we must play to the best of our ability and believe that our God will guide and protect us. We must also recognize we are not meant to be here forever and if we don't take advantage of the opportunity and then, then it's gone. And after after my vapor is gone, then somebody else comes behind me and carries on what I started. So I've got to make sure that while I'm playing my part, I, I, I think, I think, I think, I look at, Sister West, I look at life as a, a, a big stage play. That we're all players. We're all on the stage call life, doing whatever it is that God created us to do, to make the difference that God created us to make, to help, hold on, to help, to help make this world a better place. But not to get so consumed with myself that I feel like I'm going to always be here. Not to get so self-consumed, but Williams, that I think that I'm the only person that can do what I can do. <laughs> that nobody can do it as good as I can. 
No, that's not why God blesses us for us to get the big head and think that we're the only ones that can do it the way we can do it. No, he gives us those gifts, those talents that we have to make a difference and help somebody else. And while we're doing it, Sister Moses, we got to remember that somewhere out there, our replacement is waiting. There's going to be a time when you and I are no longer on the scene. But guess what? Every Wednesday and every Sunday, somebody's going to show up at Mount Calvary to have Bible study, Sunday school, and Sunday morning service. Why? Because our replacement player is somewhere out there. So let's get into this. Let's get into this. Let's get into this and let's see. Let's see what's let's see what's happening. Now, now, now last week, now last week, what happened? Jesus did what? He got on Cloud Airline, right? And he just took off. Riding on the cloud. Going back to heaven. The disciples are so awestruck that all they can do is what? Sit there and what? Look up, wondering what in the world is going on. Then, then again, we had those, 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 those men in the white robes, they show up again, right? And they say, why y'all looking up? Why you, why, why you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven, he will come back in the same way that you see him go in to heaven. Now, he had told him the week before that, that I'm getting ready to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to give you a comforter. John was baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost, right? So, 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 so now it's Time for the Holy Ghost to step in, right, Dee? And do what Jesus did before Jesus left, right? Hang with me because I'm going to take you somewhere that you probably ain't never been. To do what Jesus did before Jesus left. To remind us of Jesus to comfort us in times of trouble to encourage us to move forward and to help us while we're moving who does that sound like Jesus the Holy Ghost steps in to do what Jesus did while Jesus was on earth Jesus leaves go sits at the right hand of the Father right making an accessory for you and me. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Father, they know what they do. But forgive them anyhow. Father, look. Give them another chance. Don't get rid of them. Don't kill them. Not right now. Give them life and give them life more abundantly. That's what Jesus does for us now. The Holy Ghost is the one that is working for us on earth. Right? So it is the Holy Spirit that encourages us. It is the Holy Spirit that guides us. It is the Holy Spirit that teaches us and protects us and provides for us. It is the Holy Spirit that is doing for us now what Christ did for us when Christ was on earth. Christ is in heaven sitting on the right hand of the Father. But we have a comforter Speak to my heart, Holy Spirit, sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, fill us with your love and for these blessings 
we will lift our hands in praise. So now the Holy Spirit is being introduced, okay? Now the Holy Spirit is going to start doing what it is the Holy Spirit does in the lives of God's people. All right, so Jesus is gone now, right? Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Read 12, 13, and 14, somebody. Somebody, somebody count how many names that is. Let's count. Peter 1, John 2, James 3, Andrew 4, Philip 5, Thomas 6, Bartholomew 7, Matthew 8, James son of Alphaeus 9, Simon the Zealot 10, and Judas the son of James 11. Not 12. 11, they all joined together in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, okay? Now, the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. Somebody real quick, somebody real quick, go to Luke chapter 22, verse 39. Luke chapter 22, verse number 39. Luke chapter 22, verse 39. What does it say? Where did he go? To the Mount of Olives, right? If you continue to read Luke chapter 22, you will find that his passion starts right there in the Mount of Olives, right? Now go back to Acts chapter 1 and just read the A clause of verse number 12. Verse 12, what does it say? Okay, so we have the beginning of the passion narrative of Christ when he's betrayed, when he's arrested. It all begins at the Mount of Olives. Now the disciples come back and we find them all together where? At the Mount of Olives. Olive, right? And we find out in this scripture, we find next, we find the power of prayer. But we also find next, we also find that the place where one chapter stops can be the place where another chapter begins. Right? Because the Mount of Olives is where Jesus begins his whole passion motif the whole passion narrative begins at the Mount of Olives he ends up in Jerusalem he ends up buried he ends up dead he ends up getting up in three days he ends up staying here 40 days talking and popping in every now and again to his disciples. After he gets on cloud airline, airline cloud, and he goes into heaven, we begin the next chapter of the church. 
Where does that chapter start? That chapter starts in the same place where the ending of our Savior's life begins. What am I trying to say? Oftentimes, the very place that you try to get away from because it hurts you, because you cry, because it was difficult, oftentimes, that's the very place that your next chapter will begin. As much as you try to get away, you can't get away. As much as you try to, to stay away, you can't stay away. It's not by accident that verse 12 says, they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives because the Lord wanted them to see the very place that makes you cry can also be the place that you begin to laugh. The very place where you saw death can also be the very place where God will give you life. The very place that looks like it was going to destroy you can also be the place that will develop you. It blew my mind when I sat down long enough and read that. And the Lord said, look at that. And I said, okay, I'm looking at it. The Lord said, look at that. I said, okay, I'm looking at it. The Lord said, look at it. And then I said, it's the same place. But the last time we were there, we were introduced to the ending. This time we're there. We're at the beginning. Isn't it amazing that God can give you an ending and a beginning at the same place? If you just hang in there and hold on and don't give up, the same place that your head was lowered can be the place that your head is held high. The same place your heart is broken can be the place where God puts your heart back together again. Now, we read the 11 names. How many disciples did he have? 12. They are beginning the church, Sister McKenzie. And they begin in the church, one player down. You're beginning a new walk. And you're beginning your new walk with fewer people than you had in your old walk. You're, be you're, you're, be you're beginning your new ambitions, your new dreams. You're, you're, you're seeing things from different perspectives. And the perspective that you're seeing it from now doesn't have as many people involved in it when you saw it before. Where you're going, you don't have a bigger crowd now as you had before. Why? Because you'll find out you will find out next, you'll find out that sometimes the group you start with will not be the group you finish with. Sometimes the people you start with won't be the people that finish it with you. Sometimes the folks you start building the church with won't be the people that God keeps you there to do what God is calling you to do. Sometimes those that you start with won't be the ones that you finish with. But because people drop off doesn't mean that you got to stop. You got to remember the calling that God has on your life. And you got to know that if one person moves out the way, the Lord will put the right person in your path to help you to be who God is calling you to be. Right? So we find, we find that sometimes the group you start with won't be the group you finish with. And what do they do when they get there? They all join together con constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. I tell y'all, if y'all read the Bible, you'll see Women playing an intricate part of basically everything that happens. And you can sit there and act like the Lord can't use them and don't listen to them. Apparently he do. Because they were there with the 11. Praying. 
worshiping, being a part of this group that is responsible for creating the church as we know it today. It says they all join together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So what does that mean the women and Mary and the mother, the mother of Jesus and his brothers were also doing? Praying. Praying. Lord, give me a praying mama. Because a praying mama know how to talk to the Lord. Give me a praying sister. Because a praying sister know how to talk to the Lord. Give me a praying sister. Give me a praying mother of the church. Wear her moo moo. Because they know how to talk to the Lord. And tell the Lord all about it. Here we are. And we find them praying. Because prayer next, prayer at Calvary, is powerful. Why? Because prayer brings us together. They weren't fighting. They weren't bickering. They weren't arguing. They weren't worried about who was going to be the head. They weren't worried about whose name was going to be on the marquee. They weren't worried about who was going to the credit. All they wanted to do is to play their part on the stage of life as long as the Lord would let them play it to be a kingdom builder on earth. They were praying and they were praying together because prayer brings people together. They were also unsure of what the future hell so they ain't been with Jesus for the last three years and some months they had seen him do stuff that they'd never seen done before now he's gone and not only is he gone but he tells me you got a part to play in my church you got to be a kingdom builder you got to bring people to me Watch this, without me. You got to bring people to me. And you think you're bringing your people, the people to me without me, but remember, I left you a comforter that's going to help you get the people to me. So you know that they were dealing with trouble. Anybody ever had self-doubt? Anybody ever felt like the Lord was calling you to do something or that was a goal for you to accomplish or that was something for you to do or that was somebody for you to help that you, 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 you felt a, a twinge in your spirit that there was somebody or something that you could do to help make it better and you every time would start talking yourself out of your responsibility. Why? Because oftentimes when God says can, we see can't. And where God says, I believe in you, we say, I don't believe in my self. So even though you do, you know you have something on you. You know you have something that God wants you to do. You know you have something that you're supposed to accomplish. It eats at you. It gnaws at you. Every time you try to walk away from it, it won't let you sleep at night. Maybe you're supposed to be the one in your neighborhood that gets your neighborhood together. Maybe you're supposed to be the one in your family that teaches your family that as long as we yelling at each other ain't none of us hearing anything why don't we sit down and try to talk to each other maybe you're supposed to be the one in whatever ministry you're in to say to those in the ministry let's look at this from a different perspective but because that ministry has always looked at it the way that it's looked at it you're telling yourself and that they ain't gonna matter nothing's gonna change things are not gonna get better what 
do you do it? You're giving yourself an excuse not to do what the Lord said do. And if you think the Lord's going to leave you alone, you got another thing coming. You want to throw them away, but you can't. You want to give up, but you can't. You want to leave here and say, I ain't going back. <laughs> but you can't. You want to say, that's the last time I'm saying this Sunday was the last Sunday I'm singing in the choir. Then next week you right back up there. Because you can't. Because that's your calling. That's your purpose. That's your script in the play called Life. So what we have to learn how to do is we have to learn how to stop having self-doubt and start praying and believing and talking to the Lord about it. Why? Because not only does prayer bring us together, but next, prayer also brings us through trouble. Yeah. Yeah, whoever said prayer changes things, we're lying. Prayer changes things. Yes, it does. Prayer changes things. Prayer gives you strength when you didn't think you could find no strength. Prayer changes things. Prayer gives you rest when you couldn't find any rest. Prayer changes things. Prayer gives you peace in the middle of chaos. Prayer changes things. Prayer blesses your children and you didn't even know that the Lord knew what you was talking about. Prayer does something for you. It brings us through trouble. And they're praying because Sister Carl, they are facing a task that they had never faced before. Remember Jesus told them last week, I need you to go. You okay, Jesus, I go. But I need you to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all over the world. Hold up, Jesus. I was good with Jerusalem, but I don't like them people over there. They don't look like me, they don't talk like me, they don't walk like me, they don't dress like me, they don't eat what I eat. Jesus, I don't care, go. They're facing a task that looks too big. And what I love about it is, Sister Moses, before they even begin to do it, they start in prayer. They ain't knocked on nobody's door yet. But they praying. They, they hadn't raised a dime yet. But they're praying. They haven't made any phone calls yet. But they are praying. <laughs> they, they, they hadn't broken up in, into different committees yet. But they are praying. Our problem is we pray after we move. We don't pray before we move. Because if we would pray before we move, a lot of the moves we make, we would never make. Because the Lord said, oh, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is you're doing. That don't have anything to do with me. You doing that because you want to do that. No, I need you to sit still. And I need you to pray and seek my face. And if you pray, prayer will bring you through trouble. Prayer also does something. Next, prayer prepares you for what is ahead of you. You ever prayed about something? And to be, on, and to be honest with you, you, after you prayed, you kept on with life and you've had other things come up and you prayed a different prayer. Matter of fact, you forgot you even prayed that prayer. 
until you get to that place that that prayer prepared you for. And you say, oh, Lord, I prayed about this. And the Lord promised me he would take care of me if I did and such. So now I'm ready because I've been prepared for what's ahead of me because before I got to it, I prayed about it. Remember, Davis, a lot of us pray about it when we get to it. And we ain't talk to the Lord before we got to it. Then we get to it and it looks too big for us. Then we want to pray about it. If we would have prayed about it before we got to it, when we got to it, we would have what we need to handle it because the prayers would have prepared us for what was ahead of us. Right? Prayer prepares you for what is ahead of you. They're praying. Asking the Lord, show us the way. They're praying, believing that the Lord is going to take care of them. Verse 15, jacked me up. What does it say? What does verse 15 say? In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about a hundred and twenty. So it was a hundred and nine more than the eleven disciples. Who stands up? Who stands up? Verse 13 says, those presents were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Ephias, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. And who stands up? Sister Cookie, I would have expected anybody but Peter to stand up. What was Peter doing the last time? We, there were two of them in that group that I would expect anybody other than these two to stand up. I already gave y'all one. Who you think the other one is? Judas dead. He ain't standing up. He, he, he hanging upside down. That's another Judas. Same name, different person. So we're going to take Judas out. And then, to me, there were two other people that I would have never thought would have stood up. Peter was one of them. Who do you think could have been the other one? Thomas. I would have expected anybody other than Peter and Thomas to stand up. We know why Thomas? Because he doubted him. Why you, why you have problems with Peter standing up? What did Peter do? He denied him. After the Lord told him. Man, look here. You're doing all this talking here at this table. You're going to betray me three times for the, for the rooster even crow. He said, I never deny you. Okay. Then rooster got the crowing. Before the rooster got to crowing, when the heat got hot, because he was standing at the fire, remember? And the people came by and said, you look like. That ain't me. Man, you look like. Turn around. 
Man, I said that ain't me. Man, you look like you was with him. He cussed. He ain't gonna say what he said because then y'all gonna be talking about me. I said I wasn't with him. What he didn't realize is when you walk with Jesus, there's something about you that shows that you've been walking with him. Then the rooster crows. Fast forward. Mary finds Jesus. After he gets up, Jesus tells Mary, go tell my disciples and Peter to meet me where I told them to meet me. Why did he say and Peter when he said my disciples? I tell you why, I believe. I believe Peter thought he had lost his disciples, his, his disciples calling. His membership had, his membership had been revoked. His membership was no longer. He had lost his privileges. Membership has its privileges and he felt he had lost all his privileges. But even when he felt like he had turned his back on Jesus, he knew he had turned his back on Jesus, Jesus still didn't turn his back on him. He says, go tell my disciples and Peter to meet me where I told them I'd be in Galilee. Punch pause, hit fast forward, punch play. Here we are. Peter stood up among the believers. Wow. <laughs> wow. So call that blue beat, that blew my mind. I know G if you ain't never thought Jesus was better than you, just think about that right there. Because you know you wouldn't have had Peter no way in your circle. You would have you would have threw Peter away a long time, man. I don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need you. But he stands up. Among the believers. Why? Because next we have an unlikely leader. I thought Bart would be, you know, Bartholomew. How many of y'all saw Bartholomew's name on there? You're like, who is Bartholomew? Because you don't hear much about him. Right? But now we have an unlikely leader. Why? Because next, even in our wrong, the Lord can still see our worth. He knew, Sister McKenzie, that even though Peter denied him, there was still something in Peter. Do you love me? What was significant about that three times to you? After that third time, he said, Lord, I hadn't told you now. Wow. Anybody else notice that correlation? The three times Jesus asked him the same question three times, the very same way, three times. Ma'am? The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. That could be symbolic of the, the, the coming of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the Trinity. That's good. Y'all ready for a six-page paper? <laughs> so it's interesting, Sister Cook, that you make that correlation 
And it's interesting that you make the correlation of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost with the, representing the three times that Jesus asked him. I, too, made that, have made that correlation that Jesus asked him three times as a way of redemption for, for Peter denying him three times. And if you notice, Jesus asked him, do you love me? And he says, yes. And then the Lord talks to Peter about Peter's responsibility to be a kingdom builder. He says, feed my sheep. He, it, it wasn't even about Peter anymore. It was about Peter's responsibility to build a kingdom. If you love me, build a kingdom. How do you build a kingdom? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep and you'll do what it is that I created you to do. Even in our wrong, the Lord can still see our worth. How many times have you made yourself worth less? When the Lord says you're worthy. How many times have you allowed your mistakes to beat you down? When the Lord's trying to pick you up from your mistakes. How many times have you said, he can't use me because I did such and such? When the Lord says, I can use you in spite of you doing such and such. As a matter of fact, that such and such that you did, you needed to do because I'm use that to help make you better. And see things from a different perspective. I love the fact that even in my wrong, the Lord can still see my worth. Peter, Lord, get up, talking to the people. Peter, preaching. Unlikely leader. Sometimes the Lord will pick the last person that you would have picked. To help build his kingdom. And sometimes the last person you think he would pick is you. As a matter of fact, sometimes you say, Lord, pick anybody but me. Next. The same one that denied the Lord is now proclaiming the Lord. The same one that denied the Lord is now proclaiming the Lord. Okay, now let's talk about it. Verse 16 and 17. Somebody read that real quick. Verse 16 and 17. let you mull over that Peter says brothers and sisters the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. What does it sound like Peter doing? What is Peter giving? It's a word that starts with an E. Some empathy? Looks like to me, he's given Judas' eulogy. And it looks like he has empathy for Judas. 
This is my mind. He kind of know his. So Sister Cook said that Peter denied Jesus, Judas betrayed Jesus, so it could it would make sense that Peter could have some empathy for Judas because they may have walked in each other's shoes or at least down similar roads. Maybe not the same roads, but they were perpendicular to each other. You know. Denial is betrayal. That's another good point. Denial is betrayal. Let's hone in on the scripture had to be fulfilled. saying about what Judas did. If it had to happen, what is that saying about the one by which it happened? He was born for that purpose. Ooh. Ooh. See, this is why I like y'all talking back to me, because this is deep. This is this is this is deep because when I looked at this scripture, my whole mindset about Judas took a turn. And I began to ask myself this question. Did he have a choice? Not if he was chosen for it. See, we ain't ready for these kind of conversations at church. Because Judas is always viewed as the scum of the earth. Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. So I don't, y'all help me, and even on Facebook, if you want to put in the, in, the, in, the, in the comments line, tell me how I'm supposed to feel about Judas. We have to forgive. So, so you said this is really not about Jesus. It's more about I 
love when I get in y'all's heads. Because I, I, I want you, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to think, but I also want us to be careful about being so quick to judge people based on choices that they make. Because I am a contender that we are more alike than we are different. Right. And we as and we as kingdom builders, somewhere along the way, there was a kingdom builder that came in contact with that person at the right time, at the right place to give them some type of encouragement, some word, some deed, something where they could see God in the midst of where they were. And then things started happening, falling into place. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I do believe that somewhere there was a kingdom builder involved. Right. Did Judas have a choice? He was born for that. He had no choice. Y'all are good. And guess what? There is no right or wrong answer. I go back and forth as with about how I am suppo supposed to view Judas. And at the end of the day, I come to this conclusion. I'm supposed to love him as I love myself. Despite what he did. Whether or not it was his lot, his calling to do that. I'm gonna take you a little bit further. Jesus was the son of God, God in human form who knew everything that God knew. And if Judas had been prophesied way back in David's time, Jesus from the lineage 
of David. Did not Jesus know who he was and what he was going to do when he chose him? And I got one group got a six-page paper on why he had no choice, and I got another group got a six-page paper on why he did have a choice. It's a lot on that bone. And if, he, and I was getting ready to get there, if, if he had not, if he had not have had the scriptures fulfilled, there would be no reason for us being here right now. So what God may allow that does not benefit somebody else may be, may be meant to benefit others. Wow. Wow. So you mean the hell you went through didn't benefit you, but the Lord allowed you to go through it because he wanted to somebody else, more people to get benefits from what you went through than you got. Wow. Lord, you mean I went through that and it wasn't even for me? No. It was for somebody else to be saved. We through, but we're going to talk about this some more next week. I think we need to bring the tables out really pretty soon. And when we get in our other building, we're going to do that. Next. <laughs> no way around it. No way around it. Next. Some things have to take place for you to get to your promised position. Next, some things you can go around and some things you have to go through. Some things you can go around. Some things you have to go through. Judas gets a rap, y'all. But when I read the scripture, I have to really talk to the Lord and say, Lord, give me a better understanding of this. So we're going to talk about it more next week because next week we're going to find out what he did and what he did as a result of what he did. Judas. <laughs> we gonna find out what Judas did and find out what happened as a result of we're gonna talk more about what Judas did. And then I want to spend a little time looking at when he messed up and he knew he messed up what he did to try to remedy or fix or get away from, escape the mistake that he made if Sister Teresa is really a mistake at all. All right, put your hands together. Give God, y'all, y'all looking. Boy, y'all look so deep right now. Boy, I love it. The looks on y'all faces. Y'all like, I ain't never going to Bible study again, Pastor, because you ain't have to. These are conversations that we have to have and we need to have. And we need to, and we need to try to bring them from first century to 21st century and make them applicable to the times in which we live. Because you never know 
what somebody is going through to cause them to do what they do. Right? And it's so easy to judge and condemn people rather than trying to understand them. If Judas could write us a letter trying to explain what he was going through, I think that that letter would break our hearts. What did you say, Sister McKenzie? Turn that paper in. <laughs> that six page paper. <laughs> All right, let's put our hands together and give God some praise. If you have a seed, you can bring your seed up to the altar. To the altar. I think you can um, walk around and receive the, the seed offerings. Those that are watching us, you can go to our website, www.mcbctheplace.com. Click the donate button. You can send via Cash App, dollar sign MCBC The Place, or you can send via money uh, through the mail, P.O. Box 2672, Baytown, Texas, 77522. We serve a good God. <laughs> so Teresa said, I ain't like Judas at first, but now I'm starting to feel a little different about the fella. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right let us pray lord thank you for these seeds we pray oh god that you would bless the the gifters that the seed will return to them for force in jesus name we pray amen let us all stand for our closing prayer remember sister eames remember pastor williams remember sister sanders uh, anyone else who may be a sick or shut in, uh, remember them, um, that the Lord will touch them right where, um, right where they are. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, for, call, for giving us the courage to look beyond the surface and our efforts to be kingdom builders. To not be so quick to judge, but try to be more understanding. Lord, we found that we are more alike than we are different. And we never know what we will do until we get in certain situations and circumstances. Give us the strength, oh God, to be those kingdom builders to help somebody along the way. We get ready to leave this place. Don't let us leave you. Go with us, stand by us, guide us, and protect us. And as always, Master, be between us as we're absent one from another. These and all other blessings we ask in Jesus' name we pray and all the believers said together, amen. Calvary, because you are who you are, you do what you do, you go where you go, and you know what you know. You will, you are, and forever will be the place. <laughs>